If you're familiar with Maurice Sendak's children's book, Where the Wild Things Are, you may be familiar with the idea of a wild rumpus. Uh, This passage is a holy rumpus. It's a frolicking, joyful gallop to Jesus. There's almost nothing else like it in the Bible. It's just this, this party of excited people from every corner of the planet running, riding, sailing to get to Jesus as fast as they possibly can because they've found hope in Him. Isaiah chapter 60, verse 1. Arise, shine, for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you. And His glory will be seen upon you. And nations shall come to your light, and kings of the brightness of your rising. Lift up your eyes all around and see. They all gather together. They come to you. Your sons shall come from afar, and your daughters shall be carried on the hip. Then you shall see and be radiant. Your heart shall thrill and exult because the abundance of the sea shall be turned to you. The wealth of the nations shall come to you. A multitude of camels shall cover you. The young camels of Midian and Ephah, all those from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and frankincense and they shall bring good news of praises to the Lord. All the flocks of Kedar shall be gathered to you and the rams of Nebaioth shall minister to you. They shall come up with acceptance on my altar. I will beautify my beautiful house. Uh, Who are those that fly like a cloud and like doves to the windows? For the coastlands shall hope for me. The ships of Tarshish first to bring your children from afar. Their silver and and their gold with them. For the name of the Lord your God. for For the Holy One of Israel. Because He has made you beautiful. Foreigners shall build up your walls. And their kings shall minister to you. For in My wrath I struck you, but in My favor I have had mercy on you. Your gates shall be continually open. Day and night they shall not be shut. The people may bring to you the wealth of the nations with their kings led in procession. For the nation and kingdom that will not serve you shall perish. Those nations shall be utterly laid waste. The glory of Lebanon shall come to you. The cypress, the plain, the pine to beautify the place of My sanctuary. And I will make the place of My feet glorious. The sons of those who afflicted you shall come bending low to you. And all who despised you shall bow down at your feet. They shall call you the city of the Lord, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel. Whereas you have been forsaken and hated, with no one passing through, I will make you majestic forever. A joy from age to age. You shall suck the milk of nations. You shall nurse at the breast of kings. And you shall know that I am the Lord. I, the Lord, am your Savior and your Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. Instead of bronze, I'll bring gold. Instead of iron, I'll bring silver. Instead of gold, sort of wood, bronze. Instead of stones, iron. I will make your overseers peace and your taskmasters righteousness. Violence shall no more be heard in your land. Devastation or destruction within your borders. You shall call your walls salvation and your gates praise. The sun shall be no more, your light by day, nor for brightness shall be the moon. Shall the moon give you light? But the Lord will be your everlasting light, and your God will be your glory. The sun shall no more go down, nor your moon withdraw itself. Sorry, nor... Your sun shall no more go down, nor your moon withdraw itself, for the Lord will be your everlasting light, and your days of mourning shall be ended. Your people shall all be righteous. They shall possess the land forever. 
the branch of my planting, the work of my hands, that I might be glorified. The least one shall become a clan, and the smallest one a mighty nation. I am the Lord. In its time, I will hasten it. Let's pray. Father, Your salvation is a joyful thing. It makes You sing. It makes us sing. It makes the nations rush to You. Lord, would You break into this world of perpetual bad news and doom scrolling and show us what's really going on. We pray that You'd give us hope and joy in Your Gospel this morning, no matter how discouraged or despairing we may be. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I grew up in a home uh, where if you had somewhere to go and you were not out of bed on time, my dad could always be heard crowing like a rooster, rise and shine and give God the glory. And of course, like every teenager, that's just exactly what I wanted to do when I heard those words. Of course, like most kids, I probably rolled over and complained about his obnoxious alarm slash call to worship. Isaiah 60 begins with God the Father calling His people to rise and shine. Literally. Verse 1. Arise. Shine. Your light has come. And even though God's people in the Old Testament were known for rolling over and going back to bed, giving themselves again and again to habitual wickedness, and ignoring God, this time, when they heard the words rise and shine, they listened. In Isaiah 60, they get lit up by God's light. They shine so brightly that the world starts flocking to them. And by the end of the chapter, things are so bright, there isn't even a sun in the sky anymore. But the world is more radiant than ever before. I'm just going to begin by telling you how I understand this chapter, then I'll explain why in a bit. In verses 1 and 2 of Isaiah 60, we are speaking about when Jesus came to earth, shining His light on His people. In verses 3-17, through 17, we are hearing a description, the most glorious description, of what it looks like for nations to flock to that light, which they've been doing ever since. And in verses 18-22, through 22, we move beyond world history to the time when Jesus will shine so brightly that the sun will be out of a job. We need this chapter so badly. The news on the TV, the news in our personal lives, the news on our social media feeds, well, there's a reason they call it doom scrolling. This chapter reminds us, though, that history is not getting darker and darker, but it's full of light. Just because the reporters missed the story doesn't mean the story's not happening. It reminds us that in the life of Christ, light has dawned on the world. This chapter reminds us right now that throughout history, light is drawing nations that have spent their whole history up until that point in the dark. And this chapter reminds us that in eternity, believers will live in a world where Jesus has replaced the sun. Let's soak in the sun of this glorious passage. Here's the first point. The light of Christ has dawned on the Jews. The light of Christ has dawned on the Jews. Isaiah 60 was written to people in a dark place. The Jews uh, who would read Isaiah's letter were in captivity under a dark, oppressive Babylonian regime. They were captives in Babylon, a foreign land to them. In Isaiah 60, God tells them to start shining their light because glory has dawned on them. What's He telling them to do? I mean, here you are, you're a captive and get up and read the Bible in the morning and God says, start shining! What's He saying? It could be He's talking about when they got out of Babylon and went back to Israel. That's a kind of shining. Certainly a display of God's glory. 
Certainly it was a bright and shiny day when God delivered them from their captivity in Babylon. That was a good day. But honestly, it's not as good as it gets. When that day happened, when Israel got delivered out of Babylon and got to come back to their homeland, they went home, rebuilt their temple. The old guys who saw it cried because it wasn't as good as the old temple. They struggled with compromise. They got to stay at home and not in Babylon, but eventually they got taken over by the Romans who wound up being way worse than the Babylonians. That can't be the glorious light that this passage is talking about. No, in Isaiah, the light that dawns generally refers to Jesus. In Isaiah 9, chapter 2, there's a prophecy that says, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. And when Matthew, writing in Jesus' day, read Isaiah chapter 9, he said, that's happening now. Jesus is the one who is the great light who shines when people walk in darkness. In Luke's Gospel, when Zechariah is singing about Jesus coming, he says, the sunrise. What a great image for the incarnation. The sunrise of world history. The sunrise shall visit us on high to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death. Now if Isaiah and Matthew and Zechariah are not enough for you, listen to the words of Jesus Himself. He said, I have come into the world as light. Have you gotten used to that? I mean, that you have any clue how to live is because He has come into the world as light. If you have any hope in this dark, dismal, despairing world, it's because He has come into the world as light. I have come into the world as light so that whoever believes in Me may not remain in darkness. The light that shone on Israel in Isaiah chapter 60, the verse we're looking at right now, the light that's shining in the world is His light. The light of Christ. His words were light. His example was light. The darkest day of His life was the brightest of them all when He died on the cross to give hope to sinners who needed their sins atoned for. If Jesus had not come, this world would be utter darkness. But because He came, there's light. And that's what Isaiah is talking about when he says to the Jews, Arise, shine, for your light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Now we actually learn something here about what makes God's people different. What makes God's people different? I was listening to an old Scottish preacher this week, or in the last few weeks, by the name of Eric Alexander. And he was mentioning that when he was a kid, he was taught that what makes Christians different was that they didn't go to the movies. Well, you all are failing miserably at that. That's how you're attempting to be different. And there are certainly some movies that Christians shouldn't be found watching. But being a Christian is far more than anything external like going or not going to the movies. What a shallow definition of what it is to be a child of God. What makes a Christian different? I mean, at root. What makes a Christian different? What makes a Christian different is that the glory of God has shone on their souls and they've loved it. That's what a Christian is. A Christian is one who has seen the glory of God and they haven't been able to keep walking by. but they've been stopped dead in their tracks and the direction of their life has been changed forever by the glimpse of glory 
they've received. Isaiah chapter 60, verse 1, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples, but something different about you, but the Lord will arise upon you, and His glory will be seen upon you. The world sees Him, and they see nothing special. The Christian sees Him, and they see glory. He lights up our path. He gives us the best explanation for why things are so wrong in the world. It's that mankind is in rebellion against Him. He shines His light and shows us we cannot do anything with this rebellion in our hearts. Our best attempts to get better are just more rebellion. If you recognize how bad you are and you set out to be better, your attempt to be better is just one more attempt at self-righteous rebellion. One more attempt to do something in your own strength, which was the problem. He shines a light on that. And so you're left in a position where you can't fix anything. You know it's wrong, but you can't fix anything. We can't overcome it. We can't escape the guilt of our sin. We can't atone for it. We can't outdo it with our good deeds. And He just keeps shining light on our darkness. And He shows us that we're hopeless. But then He takes us to the cross and He puts a spotlight on the cross. He shows us that there we're dying for, He's dying for sinners like us. He shines His light on us to show us how hopeless we are, but then He shines His light on Him to show us the light of hope. Love has come. And He's come to die for sinners. And then after He shows us the greatest blaze of light that has ever come into the world, the blaze of light that came out of the empty tomb. The tomb from which He was resurrected. You know the song? See what a morning. Glorious and bright. I'd sing it to you, but I kept doing it at home and I kept getting in trouble at the high parts. See what a morning. Glorious and bright with the dawning of hope in Jerusalem. Folded the grave clothes. Tomb filled with light as the angels announce Christ is, live, listen, is risen. The voice that spans the years. Speaking life. Stirring hope. Bringing peace to us. Will sound till He appears. For He lives. Christ is risen from the dead. He's the light believers have seen. He's what makes you different. He's the light that distinguishes His people from the people who walk in darkness. Are you a Christian? Yes. Yes. Amen! There's a few of you here this morning. <laughs> uh, but for every yes, there's probably a few wondering souls. Have I ever seen glory in the face of Jesus? If He said to me, you can go, would your soul rise up and go, where would I go? You alone have the words of eternal life. That's a Christian. In the words of Carl Ellis, they're grace junkies. They can't get enough. They can't quit. They're hooked on the grace that's only found in Jesus Christ. Now these words are speaking about when Christ appeared to the Jews and some received His light. That's what made them different. They received the light of Christ. That's what made the first viewers of Jesus different than those who walked in darkness as they saw the light. And you might be saying, okay, Ryan, you're saying that's coming at the time of Christ, but I've read the time of Christ and uh, most of them didn't receive the light. In fact, John says, he came to His own. His own did not receive Him. Don't, fin don't forget to finish the verse. But to as many as did receive Him, He gave the right to become children of God. Not all the Jews received His light. The majority of the twelve tribes of Israel or what was left of them had no interest in Him. But there were twelve men who would start a new Israel. And they saw the light. 
By the time he died and rose again, there were at least 120 believers. They had seen the light. And these are the people Isaiah 60 is talking about. Isaiah is saying to them the same thing Jesus would say to his followers in the Sermon on the Mount. You are the light of the world. Let your light so shine before men that they see your good deeds and glorify your Father who's in heaven. Isaiah 60, if I haven't made it clear yet, here's my last try, is telling us that the time when Christ came, His light shone on the Jews and brought those who believe out of the darkness. Second point. Nations will come to the light that shone on the Jews. Nations will come to the light that shone on the Jews. Now, Emmanuel, you have heard this message preached nine ways to Sunday. You have heard He is building a community from all cultures where Christ is King so many different ways. How do I say it to you again? Well, I've got a great passage in front of me to make this glorious point. We know that the Savior to the Jews has reached down and included us, the Gentiles, the nations, the countries that aren't Israel, in His salvation plan. You know this. But I promise you, even if you know this truth, like the back of your hand, Isaiah 60 can make missions glorious again. The Scottish preacher, another one, uh, William Still, I love this. He described Isaiah 6 as boisterous. Buoyant. And it is. The nations are literally riding, running, and sailing to get a piece of the action. To get in on the light of Christ that is shone on the Jews. Let me show you this and notice it in a number of different ways. First, notice who is coming. Who is coming? Verse 2, the nations are coming. You see that at, sorry, verse 3, the nations will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. And all kinds of nations that we don't associate with coming to Jesus are coming to Jesus. Look down at verse 6 and you see this, the young camels of Midian and Ephah, the Saudi Arabia, coming to Jesus. Sheba, shall come, verse 6, modern day Yemen. Kedah, Kedar, and Nebaioth, northern Arabia, and Jordan. And Tarshish, it's debated, but it's either Lebanon or Spain. The nations are streaming in to the light that God has displayed in the light of Christ. Now notice what they are coming to. Verse 3, says this, the nation shall come to your light. The kingdoms, the kings shall come to the brightness of your rising. They're, they're coming to the Jewish people who received Christ, to Peter and Paul and all those who received Him, but they're coming primarily to their light. To what Christ has shone in His own face. Notice also why they're coming in verse 9. They see hope in all of this. Verse 9 says this, For the coastlands shall hope for Me. The ships of Tarshish first. And look elsewhere in verse 9. They're also coming because of the beauty of God's people. The end of verse 9. For the name of the Lord your God and the Holy One of Israel, because He has made you beautiful. So you've literally got Saudi Arabia coming in, Spain coming in, Lebanon coming in, and they're coming in because this light has risen on a particular people. This people that was just as ugly as every other people. Go read the history of Israel. Not pretty, but now they've been beautified and the nations are streaming in to them. And notice how they are coming. Honestly, this passage, if it had been written in 2021, it would have been called planes, trains, and automobiles. It's just they're streaming in through every which way. Uh, In verse 6, we get the description of a camel parking problem that happens in Jerusalem. Seriously, a multitude of camels shall cover you and young camels of Midian and Ephah Right? So like Joe is riding along on his 
camel with Sally and he gets there and there's 10,000 other camels there first. And she's like, I told you we should have left earlier. And, and just, <laughs> just, just this horde of camels coming in with caravans, bringing the nations in to see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And on top of that, they're sailing in on ships. Verse 8. Who are these, verse 8, that fly like a cloud? They're speeding like a cloud being blown along by the wind. Who are these that fly like a cloud and like doves to their windows for me, for the coastland shall hope for me? The ships of Tarshish first. So they're, they're sailing in with a, with a sail full of wind moving towards Jerusalem to get in on the light that's dawn in Jesus Christ. Why doesn't this make the news? You're missing the story every day. If you're missing the fact that this is what's happening in the world. And you might think that I sound like a health and wealth preacher when I say it, but all these people are coming with just buckets of money in their hands just eager to give it to Jesus. It's, and this is not, not... I might make an appeal for giving, but that's not the point of this point. It's, it's all over here. They're bringing their wealth to God. Over and over and over. They're bringing their wealth to God. Look at this in verse 5. It says there in verse 5, Then you shall see and be radiant. Your heart shall thrill and exult because the abundance of the sea shall be turned to you. They're bringing all the food out of the ocean to Israel. The wealth of the nations shall come to you. All of their wealth is moving towards the people of God. Verse 6, a multitude of camels shall come to you. And young camels of Midian, Ephah, all those from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and frankincense. They got the essential oils. They got the precious metals. They're bringing it all into the people of God. And this isn't some crass materialism. Look at the end of verse 6. They shall bring good news. The praises of the Lord. They're, they're coming in going, the light is glorious. God is glorious. Take my gold. Take my frankincense. Take my best. Take whatever I got. I want to give it all to the One whose light has shone on Israel. They're bringing animals to sacrifice. Verse 7. All the flocks of Kedar shall be gathered to you. The rams of Nabaioth shall minister to you so they shall come up with acceptance on My altar and I will beautify My beautiful house. Now listen to me. In the Old Testament, God doesn't take the sacrifices of Gentile nations. But here they can't bring rams fast enough. They can't bring something to sacrifice fast enough from all the different corners of the earth to the living God. And they're bringing silver and gold. Did I mention that already? Verse 9, For the coast land shall hope for Me, the ships of Tarshish first, to bring your children from afar, their silver and gold with them. Let the name of the Lord your God and for the Holy One of Israel because He has made you beautiful. And notice it actually uh, tells us in verse 17 that God does not move them to bring cheap stuff, but only their best. Verse 17, Instead of bronze, I will bring gold. Instead of iron, I will bring silver. Instead of wood, bronze. Instead of stones, iron. It's like everybody upsold themselves. Should I bring stones? Now nah, I'm going to bring iron. Should I bring silver? Now nah, I'm going to bring gold. They're all being moved to bring their very best to God. And what are they doing with it? They're offering sacrifices. Hold that in your mind. But they're also rebuilding Jerusalem. Verse 10, foreigners shall build up your walls and their kings shall minister to you. I mean, think about that. Some Saudi Arabian king shows up in Jerusalem and says, well, why are you here? Oh, I wanted to help. Anything I can do? I wanted to strengthen your defenses against, uh, I guess, people like me. <laughs> but I don't want to be against you anymore because I'm here to worship now. 
And I'm wondering if you could use all this gold. Foreigners shall build up your walls, and their kings shall minister to you. For in my wrath I struck you, but in my favor I have had mercy on you. Now, big question comes up. When does this happen? When do we get to see nations and kings running and cameling and sailing to Jesus to worship and rebuild the city of God? Well, I'd like to answer like this. We have been seeing it for 2,000 years. And if I get anything from the exuberance of this passage, it seems like there's a lot more yet to come. Let me explain to you what I mean, and this is going to be pretty involved, pretty glorious, but pretty involved, so as to make it a little easier. I, I tell the pastoral apprentices that I always try to include the hardest material of the sermon in the first point when people are, are most alert. But today I have failed to do that. And so here in the middle of the sermon, when you are tempted to drift off into a lovely slumber, imagining camels and gold coming to Israel, <laughs> I have something tricky to say. But I'll do it this way. I'll tell you a couple stories in a poem to illustrate what I think is happening exactly in this passage. The greatest king of Israel in terms of wealth and power was Solomon. And at the height of his power, he had rebuilt cities. He had built God's temple. And he was building everything with gold. It actually, there's actually a verse in the Kings that says, silver was cheap in Solomon's day. He did everything in gold. Nah, no, no. No shiplap for Solomon was all gold. And then right when the cities are built under Solomon's reign, and the temple is built, and the gold is flowing, a pagan queen shows up. A ruler. With, the text says, with camels and gold. And the Queen of Sheba shows up, and I'll read this to you, and she says, now when the Queen of Sheba heard the fame of Solomon, God's king, Jesus' great, 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 great dan granddaddy, now when the Queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon, she came to Jerusalem to test him with hard questions, having a very great retinue and camels bearing spices and very much gold and precious stones, and once she'd heard all his wisdom and saw all his kingdom, the Bible says, such a great line, there was no breath left in her. And she told Solomon how good, this pagan, how good Yahweh was to him. You know what she did? She gave him her gold and her spices and her precious stones. And Solomon took some of the wood or some of the spices and the, some of the gifts. And you know what he did with it? He built the temple. King gets lifted up. Pagan king shows up. Temple gets built up. Here's the poem, Psalm 72. Psalm 72, very rare in the Psalms is a psalm not of who wrote most of the psalms? David. This one's his boy tried his hand at poetry. Psalm 72 is a psalm of Solomon. And here, here's what he writes. He's praying about God's king. He's praying about God's king. And here's what he writes. May he, the king of dominion from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth, may the desert tribes bow down before him and his enemies lick the dust. May the kings of Tarshish and the coastlands render him tribute. Later on in the psalm, he'll say, bring him gold. May the kings of Sheba and Seba bring gifts. May all the kings fall down before him. All nations serve him. Hmm. 
So now Solomon's praying for more than the Queen of Sheba. He's praying for all the kings of the earth to come with gold and other gifts to give to God's King. Interesting. Fast forward a few hundred years and Isaiah is feeling poetic and he writes Isaiah chapter 60. Almost like they were reading the same Bible. Almost like the Holy Spirit's been authoring this book the whole time. Isaiah comes along and he goes, oh, they're coming, all right. Oh, they're coming. The light's going to shine and the camels are going to come in and the ships are going to sail and the gold's coming in and you're going to nurse from these kings and the kings are going to build up your walls and build up your temple and it's going to be incredible. Fast forward 700 years. Little baby's born. And a star appears in the east. Mm -mm 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 -mm. And magi gather up. What do they gather up? Tell it to me. Stop it! It's amazing! I mean, this stuff just blows my mind. I sit in my study and I say, there is a God! You can't author books like this. You can't... I, I never, it never ceases to amaze me. I've told you this a million times. I write my plans at 6 in the morning. By 9 in the morning, the day is derailed. Consistently. This God makes His plans for how the nations will bring gold and frankincense and myrrh. And He weaves it perfectly. Unstoppably. These three magi, they get to Jesus. And when they get to Jesus, who's shining on Israel, it says, we have come to worship Him. And this king starts his life with a little, uh, I don't know what you call it, gift basket of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And then he lives and he raises up 12 leaders, 12 Jews who will actually follow, unlike the 12 tribes of Israel. And he dies. And he rises again. And he 12, tells those 12 leaders, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And you fast forward 50 days from his death, and there in Jerusalem are gathered people from Rome and Phrygia and Pamphylia and Cyrene and Ethiopia, well, pretty much the whole earth. And 3,000 of them are saved in one day, cameling and sailing and coming in to get baptized from Jesus. And what do they do? They sell all their possessions and start giving to one another because they're bringing... Barnabas sells his land and gives it to the cause of the people of God. Acts chapter 4, there was not a needy person among them. But they're selling off what they have to give to the king so that the work of his kingdom can be accomplished. Oh, and since we're speaking of the work of this kingdom, what was one of the primary ways the New Testament church thought about how they were doing? What they were doing? You talk to a bunch of Christians. What are you doing? Oh, we're building the temple. We're building the temple of God here as we speak the truth to one another in love. Ephesians chapter 2. Jesus came and preached peace to you who are far off, you Gentiles, and peace to those who are near, you Jews. For through Him we both have access in one Spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the 
household of God, in case you don't know, that's temple language, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, temple language, Christ Jesus Himself being the cornerstone, temple language, in whom the whole structure, say it for me, temple language, being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. 1 Peter 2, as you come to Him, a living stone rejected by men but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves like living stones are being built up as a spiritual house. That's temple language to be a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Everything Isaiah saw is happening in front of our very eyes. And if we don't walk by faith, we miss it. 3,000 people saved in one day. Probably about 20,000 people in the church in Jerusalem alone by the end of the book of Acts. And the church continues and takes over the Roman Empire in the first four centuries spreads and has deep roots in Europe over the next thousand years. Scriptures get lost. and Martin Luther and John Calvin come and reform the church. And, oh, that's just an academic thing. They just wrote big theological treatises. No, they didn't. Calvin was counseling churches of eight and 9,000 people in France and was helping to pastor a church in Brazil because of the mighty work of God and then in this nation, which we, the parts that we think are the most secular, you had thousands of people streaming in to hear George Whitfield preach. And you had Enfield, Connecticut seeing revival under John, uh, under Jonathan Edwards. You saw, uh, in the 1800s, uh, Hudson Taylor go out to China. And within one lifetime, there are 100,000 converts in China. And over and over and over, God keeps bringing the nations, bringing the kings, bringing the peoples, bringing their money, bringing their resources so they can offer sacrifices to God. Not the sacrifices of animals, but of their very lives. And so they can build up a temple that's not made with stone and brick, but is our very lives this is what God is doing in the world. This is what we've been brought into. This is what God has given you a part of. Whether you feel like you've played the most failing part or you feel like you're having the most successful endeavors, this is what you've been brought into. God's unending, unstoppable advance to take all of the nations to the light of Christ and to bring all of their praises and glory to Him to build up His temple. It's an amazing thing. Spurgeon preached on this passage to explain to his people why so many people were getting saved. The older people in Spurgeon's congregation weren't too sure about the thousands of people that were getting saved under Spurgeon's ministry. So what did he do? He preached in Isaiah 60 and said, oh no, no, this is a mark of the move of the Holy Spirit. I wonder if we could wind up like those old people in Spurgeon's church. I mean, there's no, nothing too big is going to happen next, right? We grew a lot 10 years ago and wouldn't want to expect too much. Don't want to get carried away or anything. Emmanuel, we should be praying for busloads of people to pull up into that parking lot. We should be praying that people fly into Louisville to hear the Gospel. We should be, we should be praying that hordes more would come. I think there's elements of Isaiah chapter 60 that I look at and I say, well, I haven't seen it yet. I mean, this, this talks a lot about kings. And I called Pastor Johnny and I say, the Hebrew word kings, what does that mean? Does that mean kings? He goes, yeah, the Hebrew word kings means kings. So we got that one settled. And Isaiah, which has been so fruitful and so powerful and so clearly fulfilled, well, it looks to me like there's a lot more fulfilling to do. A lot more to come. A lot more on their way in. 
we should be praying for more to come in. We should be working for more to come in. We should be expecting that there'll be this wild rumpus, this holy frolicking, this running and galloping to Jesus. Last point. A land without a son. A land without a son. Passage starts with a light shining, continues with the nations flocking, moving, unstoppably moving towards the light. And it ends with the sun out of a job, the sun being eclipsed, because Jesus himself replaces the sun. I won't have time to turn there, but the passage I'm about to read to you is quoted and applied directly to the Lamb of God in the last chapters of the book of Revelation. There John quotes these verses in Isaiah chapter 60, verse 19. The sun shall be no more. Your light by day, nor for brightness shall the moon give you light. But the Lord will be your everlasting light. John actually says the Lamb who was crucified will be your light. You know, you, you set up a room, right? What do you do? You want to set it up for ambiance, the right lighting. And there's no better lighting than just being covered in sun rays of grace from the bright face of the Lamb forever. The Lord will be your everlasting light and your God will be your glory. Your sun shall no more go down nor your moon withdraw itself. For the Lord will be your everlasting light. The sun, S-U-N, will be gone. And the sun will shine. We took our uh, kids, the ones that are in town at least, out for a walk yesterday. And we had a talk about the pleasures of this life. The pleasures of this life. And we were talking about the pleasures that are sin in and of themselves. Porn, drugs, revenge, that kind of thing. And the pleasures that can be good in moderation. Food, drink, sex within marriage. And I asked a question in the midst of the conversation I got a pretty good answer. I asked, what are all these pleasures for? And the first answer I got was, not for themselves. They're not for themselves. That's right. The pleasure of this life are meant to give us tastes of God. They are to be received with thankfulness as proof, like displays as appetizers of His goodness and glory. And we're being told here that one of the God's greatest gift, the, the gift actually that lights up all the other gifts, the gift that grows graciously all the ingredients for Thai food. It will no longer point to Christ. It will be replaced by Christ. Heaven will be that place where we enjoy the giver directly and not simply through His gifts. Not that there won't be gifts in heaven, but Christ will not be hidden behind them or in them. He will be present, illuminating them. And in the case of the sun, eclipsing them. One of the greatest poems about this reality comes from Anne, our cousins. She was a woman from Answath, Scotland, who sat under the preaching ministry of Samuel Rutherford. And her most famous hymn comes from her pastor's dying words. She wrote a hymn that encapsulated some of his quotations and some of his dying words. And some of you may know it. It's called Emmanuel's Land. And it captures this transition that we're all going to go through if we believe. From enjoying all things mediated through the Son, S-U-N, to enjoying directly the Son, S-O-N. 
The sands of time are sinking. The dawn of heaven breaks. The summer morn I sighed for. The fair sweet morn awakes. Dark, dark hath been the midnight, but day spring is at hand. And glory, glory dwelleth in Emmanuel's land. The King there in His beauty without a veil is seen. It were a well-spent journey though seven deaths lay between. The Lamb with His fair army doth on Mount Zion stand. And glory, glory dwelleth in Emmanuel's land. O Christ, He is the fountain, the deep sweet well of love. The streams on earth I've tasted, more deep I'll drink above. There to an ocean fullness His mirthy doth expand. And glory, glory dwelleth in Emmanuel's land. But flowers need night's cool darkness, the moonlight and the dew. So Christ from one who loved it, His shining oft withdrew. And then for cause of absence, my troubled soul I scanned. But glory shadeleth shineth in Emmanuel's land. Oh, I am my beloved's, and my beloved's mine. He brings a poor, vile sinner into his house of wine. I'll stand upon his merit. I know no other stand, not even where glory dwelleth in Emmanuel's land. Let's pray. We thank You, Lord Jesus, that You have lit up the world through Your very life. We thank You that we have run to You. And we pray that more and more nations and kings would run to You. We pray we would play some part, some little part, in bringing them to You. And we pray You'd bring us home to where we don't enjoy You in good food or fine wine or even good friends. But we enjoy You first directly. And then we enjoy those things under the light of the Lamb. Pray, you, pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.